Welcome to Southside Church. Hi, my name is Greg Armel, and I am here to talk to you today about sharing your faith. And get more, more specifically, we're going to talk a lot about how to deal with objections, especially as those that deal with um, science-based understanding and as it being a substitute for God in some people's lives. And so what I want to do today is, first of all, we're going to give you a little bit of a refresher. We did a five weeks course back not too long ago earlier in the year, and we walk through the, the five-point method for sharing your faith, and I want to go through that a little bit briefly with you, just as a refresher, so the five points of sharing your faith with other people, and then we'll go into the presentation about and talk about the course as well, the other weeks that we're going to do in this course about talking about objections to the faith. But before we get into the five points, let's also remember two questions that are very good to ask. And remember, before we share our faith with other people, we also want to be able to ask for permission because we want to be respectful of others as we have them want to be able to be respectful of us. But two questions that are always good to ask, and number one of those two questions is, have you come to a place in your spiritual life where you know for certain that if you were to die today, you would go to heaven? Or would you say that that's something you're still working on? A second good question as a follow-up to that is, suppose you were to die today and stand before God and he were to ask you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? And I will tell you, after asking this questions to many people over the last few years, you get a lot of interesting insights into what people truly believe about their afterlife, what they truly believe about what's going to happen to them when they die. And it sometimes also helps people to think about that question because some have never really come to grips with their own mortality and think about where they're going to go when they die. And so it's a really interesting way to do this. And this is something a part of the EE International. So if you ever want to go look up some more information, go to EE International. They have a great program for sharing your faith. And we'll talk to you about the, this five-point method for sharing your faith because I think it's very important to go through. Just remember the thumb of that five points. This is the hitchhiker, and you're looking for a ride. You're looking for a free ride. And when you think about that looking for a free ride, I'm thinking about it in this way. I want a free ride to heaven. Where's my free gift to heaven? And the Bible says that heaven is a free gift. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And it's also not earned or deserved because the Bible also says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This not of yourselves is a gift of God, not by works so that no one will boast. And when we go to the next finger in the, in the gospel message, this is the trigger finger, and we're pointing, at our, we're pointing at somebody else, and we have three fingers pointing back at us. This is to remind us, when we point at somebody else, we have just as much responsibility pointed back at ourselves. And that is what we talk about, what it, the Bible says about mankind and what it says about ourselves. The Bible says that we are all sinners, that we all fall short of the glory of God. Not one person, except for Jesus, has not fallen short of the glory of God. We have all fallen short. We have all done it. The Bible says, uh, for um, none have, uh, all have fallen short of the glory of God. But the second part of that point is, is there a way that we could actually work our way to heaven? And the Bible also says this, to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. But I don't know about you, but I'm not perfect, and I never have been, and I'm sure most of y'all have not been either. So mankind, the Bible says, we all fall short, we're all sinners, and we can't save ourselves. The third point, when we get to this large finger, we think about what is the largest thing that we have in our lives. And the biggest, most powerful thing in our life is God. And it talks about the, the things that are, are the two things that we talk about most when we think about God. And one is that the Bible says God is love. And knowing that we have a creator that loves us and cares for us, everybody, not just Christians, God loves everybody. He loves all of his creation. But there's the other part to God in that message is that by, that God will not let the guilty go unpunished. He is a righteous judge, and he has the ability to judge his creation. So we have a problem in the fact that we are sinners. He loves us, but he hates our sin. And so when we go to the fourth point, this is the best point, and we can remember that because this is the ring finger, and we think about the bride and the bridegroom on the ring finger that talks about Jesus and his church as a relationship of the bride and the bridegroom that has been mentioned in the Bible. And we think about who Jesus is in that that, that one other point, that Jesus is the infinite God-man who came into this earth. He came into this earth and lived a blameless life and served as a perfect sacrifice for us, that he was uh, put on a cross and died there 
And the Bible says, we like sheep had all gone astray, each of us his own way, and the Lord took our iniquity, and on that cross he placed it on Jesus. And, and in that moment, our sins were forgiven and taken away from Jesus' death. And that, and that three days later, Jesus rose into heaven, and he is up there preparing a place for us. And if we go to the fifth point, and this is the pinky finger. Now remember this, because this is the smallest finger. This helps us understand one key thing. What's the smallest thing that we have in our lives that we hold on to with as much hope as we possibly can? It's our faith. And it reminds us that faith is tiny as a mustard seed, right? And being the smallest seed that was planted back in the times, this is faith as small as a mustard seed. But the Bible, what the Bible says about faith and what mankind and, and, and today's society says about faith are two different things. Because let's be clear, it's not... Uh, it's not the type of faith where it's head knowledge. Well, we understand facts and figures about Jesus. We know he was a historical figure. We know he had parents. We know when he was born, when he died. We know roughly things about him. But the Bible says that that's not the type of faith that's going to get us into heaven. In the book of James, it mentions that even the demons know who Jesus is. They know he's the creator and the savior, and they tremble in fear. So they're not looking for him for their salvation, right? So if we look at it from another perspective, faith is also not temporal faith. It's not, as my friend Alan Gravely will say, foxhole faith, where we actually sit there and say, I'm in a deep jam, God, help me out of this. And we pray and pray, and then once we get out of the jam, we tell God we're, we're done with him, and we don't need to talk to him anymore about it. That's, that's what temporal faith is. The type of faith you need to accept the gift of Jesus Christ is the faith of believing that everything he did on the cross was sufficient for your salvation, and trusting in him believing in him and turning your life over to him and letting him work in your life. I think the most powerful part and message about sharing your faith with people is to let people understand that God didn't give us this gift because we became perfect. He was perfect so we could have this gift. So you'll never be perfect when you come to the cross and you ask Jesus for forgiveness. But you better better believe once you accept his gift, he's going to change your life and it's going to be a very very special for you and you'll remember it so just remember that when you're sharing your faith with people the five points is very powerful it's a very good way of showing people five ways of understanding their faith and coming to a saving faith in jesus christ but tonight we're going to talk about how we handle objections and one of the biggest objections that i typically hear about is science-based objections and being a scientist this is very important to me so I'd really like to share some of my insights and thoughts on some of these things as we go forward this evening. And as we go to the next slide, we're going to, we're going to try to make this into a six-week course. We had a five-week course before where we talked about this hand method and really helped some of you all understand how to share your faith and to get comfortable sharing your faith. Because of the COVID-19 outbreak, we missed our opportunity to go out and put that into practice. I pray and look forward to the day when we'll be able to do that, and I guarantee you we will. We will strive to do that until we can go to the community of Clayton and talk to just about anybody that will allow us to speak. We'll, we'll do that, and I want to do that, and I know a lot of you do too. But if we look at it from this standpoint, this is a tentative outline for where we're going to be. This is week one. Uh, keep in mind that weeks two through six are kind of up in the air because we're going to have a few guest speakers, a few uh, interviews, a few different things that are going to come in here into play. And based on how we put this together, I want to give these people as much flexibility as possible. But just know this six weeks is going to be a great opportunity for you to understand how to handle objections, whether this is by faith of others or the lack of faith of others in, in a supreme being or to handle objections as it relates to science, which we're going to hopefully do this week and next week as well. So anyway, the next slide, we'll, we'll talk about uh, um, just our intro into this class, and this is just kind of a teaser. I first learned about this guy. Um, basically, I was reading a, a commentary on Job by Pastor Stephen Davies of Colonial Baptist Church, and he mentioned this guy very briefly. So I'd, I decided to do a little bit of reading on him. You can find it on Wikipedia or almost any other website if you type in his name. His name is Frain Salak, and he's a Croatian man. I thought it was funny. I asked my, my kids. I wanted to just quiz them and say, hey, do you know who this guy is? <laughs> One of them said he was a basketball player. <laughs> and I looked at Frain there. I said, uh, if he's a basketball player, I'd love to play against him because I'm not sure that that's his skill set. But what his skill set is, is being one of the luckiest people that's ever lived on this earth. And I'm just going to, you'll look at all the things up here that he's done, but he's had seven different near-death experiences he survived. 
including having a train crash in a river where 17 people died and he just suffered hypothermia and a broken arm. He had a plane flight that ended with him being forced out of mal a malfunctioning door only to land in a haystack and 19 other people perished in the crash. He had a bus that was traveling at high speeds, ran into a river and four passengers drowned and he had only minor injuries. His car blew up and uh, he barely got out of there alive, but he did, no injury. He had another time where his car set fire and blew flames out of the heat, uh, ventilation system. And the old Frayne was able to just get by with a little burnt hair. Uh, if you look at it, he also got hit by a bus, only sustained minor injuries. And this is the one that always fascinates me. He got run off of a mountain road by a UN truck, was ejected from the car, able to hang on from a tree that was dangling over the cliff's edge, only to see his car fall 300 feet. And then, if these near-death experiences aren't enough, he wins the lottery, wins $1.1 million equivalent US dollars in the lottery. So what is the odds of all this? And I think Mark Jarvis at Betting Guide did a really great job on the next slide, you'll see. He did some calculations. I wanna give him credit for it because he did some fantastic calculations here. Well, what were the odds of him surviving all near-death experiences? One in 72 octillion. Now look at that number octillion. I got it down there below. I put it in the, the frame out down there just so you could see. And then compare that to septillion. Septillion is the number of stars in the universe. So one in, in you know, one septillion, if you look at that, that is actually the idea of saying, let's just pick our star out of the universe. And that's the one star that's gonna be a creation of life. And that's the odds of that. The odds of him actually doing that uh, surviving all those instances of death were more than that. And you look at how much more, that's a lot more. Now you go even further, adding all those near-death experiences, surviving those, and winning the lottery, that is 12.7 undecillion. So that's like 100, 100 million times more than octillion times uh, likelihood that Frame survived those odds. So in all honesty, he is the world's luckiest man. All these things that happened to him are just fantastically beating the odds and, and something that most of us would be like, there's no way we would have ever survived any of that stuff. So let's go forward and take that into another example of, of odds. And I think this one, uh, Mike Riddle from Does Evolution Have a Chance and Answers in Genesis does a really good job of doing some calculations himself. And we pulled out some of these, uh, um, the, look at the human body. It's, it's 60 trillion cells, right? I, I, and before I get into that, I want to just make one other point. I mean, let's just think about this. If you, how many of y'all ever worked on cars? I mean, when I was younger, I used to work on cars. I had a mechanic friend of mine who lived down the road. He helped me work on my car. I learned a lot about working on cars. I go and look under the hood today of, an, of, of a car now, and I can't even hardly find the dipstick. I mean, things have so advanced in technology and cars, it's fascinating how much things have changed. But talk to any auto mechanic and ask them, if you put all the bottles of fluid, the oil, the steering, power steering fluid, gasoline, you put all the parts to a car and you put it inside a garage, are they ever gonna come together and form an operating machine on their own? And the answer, of course, is no. We wouldn't expect them to. We realize that there's a designer behind that car and that there are people who implement that design and make it into something that's a functioning machine. And as wonderfully advanced as a machine is, like a car, the human body is far more advanced. It's far more rigorous, far more interesting how we are a chemistry set inside of a biological system. We produce so many wonderful chemicals that keep us alive and growing and functioning, things that we don't have to have to think about doing, they just occur, right? Isn't that amazing? They just occur. And so when we look at this, our body is made up of 60 trillion cells, right? 60 trillion cells are serviced by many, many proteins, proteins that are functionally building blocks as to, of building uh, different things such as muscle tissue, but also proteins that perform a lot of chemical reactions and enzymes. And so if you look at that, uh, Tim Schroeder from the Protein Puzzle in the Biological Medicine and Cell Research uh, Journal, he said there's roughly about 80,000 to 400,000 unique proteins. Now, so the odds of creating just one functional protein by random chance is one in 10 to the 130. You saw the numbers we put up there of the likelihood of all those things that happened to Frank Salak back in the day, all the, the ways he cheated death and how he won the lottery. It doesn't even compare to the opportunity to build just one functioning protein by accident. 
And that's just the functioning of the protein itself. I mean, I'm reminded of, I've worked in a lot of areas in my career where there's been biotechnology. And a lot of biotechnology involves manipulation of a gene so that it produces a different protein. And so that different protein is oftentimes for functional value. It gives the opportunity to, say, give herbicide resistance to a plant or to give some sort of fungal resistance to a plant. It gives you opportunities to help protect a plant or other species of, uh, of uh, organism. And so when you look at those biotechnology scenarios, I know from countless examples, there's a lot of proteins that you try to mutate or make out of those changes in the genes that aren't functioning. They don't do what you originally wanted them to do. They don't give you the value that you wanted. There's a lot of random chance of where those proteins will not work for you. So I'm just saying is, just saying something randomly mutates and turns into something, it's not always the case. And so by random chance, the, the odds of actually forming one protein by accident is very, is very unlikely. So we have to start thinking about this in regards to, is there a designer of our proteins and the other functionalities of a, a great machine called the human body and plants and other species, just like there's a great designer of many automobiles? If we go to the next slide, this topic is really important to me because I am both a Christian and a scientist. And so I've heard this from both sides of the aisle. And, and, don't, and I, I like to always tell people too, don't always assume that because someone's a scientist, they're not a Christian or that they don't have some sort of faith in some other uh, religious uh, uh, faith. Because oftentimes some of the most devout people I've ever met from the science field uh, are, are really are very very devout people and they're and they have very strong held beliefs and they're very uh, very vocal about them too so don't don't always assume that a scientist is an atheist or agnostic a lot of them are very much uh, people of faith but I see this conflict from both sides sometimes we have Christians who express resentment towards scientists or educators for drawing conclusions from research and Oftentimes on the other side, I see scholars who think Christianity is superstition or just plain false. And I get a little upset when I see both of these scenarios play out because I see it from both sides. I understand the disconnect and I, I hope that there's things that we can do to, to break down those barriers. Because the main reason I get concerned is when I talk to people and share my faith with people, especially young people, uh, college age students or younger, younger adults, a lot of them are convinced that science has answered the question about a creator and that science has convinced us that a creator could not be possibly exist and that all the answers have been made and that is not anywhere close to true. There is a plethora of things that we do not understand about the physical and, and natural world and a lot of that stuff I want to talk about a little bit today just to get your peaked interest and try to see where we might want to go from here in our discussions. So what is science and what is it not? This is very critical because science is a system approach to accumulating knowledge. We use experiments, observation, interpretation of results. We use all kinds of, of different ways of looking at information to try to improve the knowledge, to try to solve problems and try to help understand mysteries. That is what science is in a nutshell. And typically when I'm researching things in science, I'm looking at past research efforts in the field. I'm theorizing new approaches to understanding it. I'm designing research studies to help me understand it, keeping in mind that there are parameters of appropriate materials and methods and trying to do the specific research you want to do to try to help understand that. And then, of course, a lot of it is measuring results, trying to look at the whether you're working in plants and you're trying to measure, measure the height and, and the mass and the yield of the plant to try to determine if your theory of what you wanted to do was actually increasing yield, decreasing yield, trying to understand how that functions, uh, putting your work to the test and try to see how you measure its success. And then at the end of the day, you're gonna draw interpretations from that. And you're gonna take those results and you're gonna propose new research because it's gonna advance the knowledge and you're gonna always wanna take that to the next level. What's the next thing I need to learn from this? And I, I think that the big critical thing that most people don't understand is science is not always certain or definitive. And I'll give you an example. I wrote a paper one time. I do a lot of things with herbicides, plants uh, of chemicals that kill plants. And I do a lot of stuff with understanding the interactions of herbicides and how some of them perform better in combinations with others. 
And you learn a lot by doing these things in regards to the symptomology and the speed of kill of different plants over time and how different combinations work better or worse than you would imagine they do. I wrote a paper one time where I was convinced, based on the site of action of both of these herbicides, that I understood the interaction. And I wrote a paper that theorized why that interaction was. And I, and I published it. And then I went back and I continued to do research. And do you know what I found? I found that I was wrong about my assumptions, that there was other factors that I had not considered, and that it led into new additional research that I learned a lot more about the process and, and trying to uncover what other factors may be really playing the role here. So my point is, is that just because somebody publishes a research paper, you can't make a lot of assumptions about it. There's still ways to go for people to understand things, for people to do their own set of research data, to compare and contrast what other researchers have done. So science is an evolving mission to get better knowledge of a subject. And I think sometimes we are quick to make quick snap interpretations of it that often leave people angry or frustrated or scared. Insert, insert the uh, emotion in there and you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, also, you gotta be careful that science is not a gauge for morality and does not judge outcomes. Um, a lot of times we sit there and think about, I, I use nuclear fission as an example. When people were doing nuclear fission, you know, this led to the creation of the atomic bomb and what are the ramifications of that from the standpoint of human life and uh, other issues associated with um, weapons of mass destruction. And so when you look back at the original work on that, a lot of this was unlocking the power of the, of the atom and trying to understand what unlocking that, what type of energy that would be produced from doing those types of things. So a lot of this is not, uh, when you're setting up these studies, you're not looking at a lot of what's the end game, what's the end game of what's gonna happen. A lot of times scientific research can, can lead to both wonderful advances and some, some very scary outcomes just based on what kind of information is derived from it. So if you're looking for science to be a moral judge of all these things, that's not the way it's set up. You're supposed to be looking for the knowledge and the answer of the, of the unanswerable, the mystery. And also, I, I think this is very important in a lot of the scientific meetings I go to, it's very clear that this is still engaged. Science is not meant to, silent discuss, uh, it's not meant to silence discussion, it's meant to encourage discussion. It's meant to encourage people to look into the answers. It's meant for, to, 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 for people to debate the solutions and for people to come up with new studies to prove their theories. That's what science is built on. And I think somewhere in some situations we lose that opportunity when people use science as, as a means to silence people in their discussions of other points. So I think that the big, biggest thing is, is people should encourage others to advance science by looking at research in a lot of different concepts and ways. That's the only way we're gonna advance knowledge and be able to understand God's creation. The other thing I point into this is also science is not a means to prove or disprove the existence of God. I mean, I always ask people this, and you can ask it in two different ways. Can this prove the existence of God? Design me a study that proves God exists. Design me a study that God doesn't exist. Science is not gonna be able to prove that. That is not capable of uh, proving an ethereal uh, spirit who, uh, who has created this world. There's no way that you can create a scientific study to prove the existence or the non-existence of God. And yet sometimes I think people use it as a means of proving that there is no God. So I, I just use that as an example, what science is and what science is not. I think some of the original issues that occurred with science and religion they started many, many years ago. Um, one of the first examples, and one that a lot of people point to, is the examples of uh, Galileo and Copernicus, where both of them um, proposed a heliocentric world, a world in which the planets revolved around the sun, as opposed to a world where the original religious um, entities of the day in the Catholic Church believed that it was the sun that uh, revolved around the earth, and that the earth was the center of creation. And so in this situation, you look at what happened to Galileo. He was sentenced to live out his days under house arrest. And at Copernicus, he would have met a similar fate. Uh, his theories were published, and he died quickly afterwards that. So he would have met a similar fate, likely, uh, for his ideas. Also, the condemnations of 1220 to 1277, where a lot of restricted teaching were based on theories of people like Aristotle and other scientists, early, early scientists of the time. Um, and I think... If you look back at some of the things they were outlawing there or trying to silence 
where some of the things that Aristotle put forward were not exactly true. They weren't correct anyway. But I think the problem we run into is, is when we silence ideas and people's ability to extrapolate and, and put out theories of ideas, then we run the risk of, of not allowing the knowledge base to continue and to not grow and to not understand the creation that we see in front of us. And ergo, if we continued down that path, we would have continued to silence people like Galileo and Copernicus from convincing us what is what we know to be a, a, an absolute truth now, that the, all the planets revolve around the sun. So anyway, that's where I think it all started. And as we go forward, but we also have to remember that the church helped establish some of the scientific principles and helped support some of the scientific institutions that were early on, especially in the United States here. You look at many of our first universities were created by churches. Uh, Harvard, Rutgers, Dartmouth, William and Mary, Yale, Notre Dame, Georgetown, Davidson, Princeton. That's just to name a few. And these are fine institutions of learning that were, that were uh, started out by churches. And we look at that and we have, um, also we also have to think that a lot of our initial scientists, some of the people that we most revere and hold on pedestals as being giants in the field of science, also left room for the vision of creator. Now some of them had different views in regards to seeing a creator in, in nature and stuff, while other ones were firm and steadfast in their faith. So we have to differentiate that, but all of them had some very interesting statements that I think we should even pay attention to here. Is one, as Sir Isaac Newton says, I have a fundamental belief in the Bible as the word of God written by those who are inspired. I study the Bible daily. Max Planck, who is the creator of quantum physics, um, he said religion and science demand for their foundation a faith in God. For the former, uh, God, God stands foremost for the latter, and at the end of at the end of all thought for religion, he represents a basis for science and a crowning solution towards a worldview. Now, Max Planck, many people will say he was not a devout, he did not have a personal relationship with a creator, but he left room that there was a possibility of a creator. Albert Einstein, of course, said, the more I study science, the more I believe in God. And Joseph Lister, I think he's one of the more interesting characters. He um, was, a, was a, the father of modern medicine because he was the first person to suggest sterilizing equipment and rooms for doing surgeries. And in fact, uh, Listerine is named after him. Um, but he says, I'm a believer in the fundamental doctrines of Christianity. And then we even have Charles Darwin, who and many will say he, he was atheist, but, I, but he did leave a lot of um, interesting statements that suggested that he at least found some possibility that there could be a creator. When he said, the question whether there exists a creator and a ruler of the universe has been answered in the affirmative by some of the high intellects that have ever existed. So even people like Charles Darwin left some room for a creator. Now if we go to the next slide, I think where our really sharp divide is, we talked about the original sharp divide in science and religion started with, if with the days of the, uh, the silencing of the church and excommunication of people of the church for teaching certain scientific principles or at least theories of, uh, of scientific uh, observation. But then it became along with Charles Darwin uh, becoming the father of modern evolutionary biology. He published many works, including The Origin of Species, uh, that document his theories on evolution. Uh, basically, his work suggests through gradual change induced by natural selection and mutation that the best traits are passed along over time, leading to improvements in species. And he even further went to say an evolution toward the formation of new species. Now, however, Darwin's uh, theories on microevolution and that microevolution being small changes in species over time due to adaptation to the environment in which they're in, there's all kinds of examples of under drought condition where birds with longer beaks that are able to reach for seeds, oftentimes they're the ones that, that breed and functionally that population becomes a larger segment of the population over time. And that's what we call microevolution and, and adaptation to change. But his, his theories on macroevolution, the evolution of uh, smaller species, uh, smaller uni, uh, unicellular and minor mu multicellular species into larger, more advanced species has never been really proven. And, the, and the, uh, the, the theory on this, especially as it relates to the fossil record, does not support that at all. And unlike we hear, we believe based on some in scientific interpretations that it is true, but that is not true at all. But those things have never been proven from a, a macro evolution standpoint. And so my question always is, is why should Christians, why does this matter to us? We, we know this to be true based on our belief in God and our understanding of the Bible. 
but why should this matter to us from a scientific standpoint? And so if we look at the next slide, there was a recent Gallup poll, and this has been done almost every year for, I think, since at least 1982. But in this 2019 Gallup poll, it was asked about evolution versus creationism, and 40% of the U.S. adults believe in creationism. And 58% of U.S. adults believe humans evolved over millions of years. Now, what's interesting about the breakout of that 58% is 33% of those 58% people believe that there is evolution, but God directed that, that there is a, a system set in place where God set this in time, and there is evolution, but God actually was the one who created it, and he set up the system in advance. But of that, there's another 22% that believe that God did not direct evolution. And what's interesting is, is that since 1982, that number of 22% of those uh, have gone, it was 9% in 1982, and now it's going up to 22%. And that number continues to grow annually of people who just believe that God has no part in anything related to creation. And so that should be concerning to all of us because people are making these assumptions based on information they hear that's not a complete picture of all the information regarding science. And I think that's why we should care as people who want people to understand, who want people to search for the truth, and who want people to look at the information and to make sound decisions based on all the facts. And that's what I think we all want people to do. As we go to the next slide, I think this is even more clear when we look at most people who believe evolution answers all the questions of creation are not scientists. I think that's very clear. And this is in the Congressional uh, Research Service. Uh, I've looked through some of their data, and it said there's roughly 7 million scientists in the U.S., which is between 1% to 2% of our population. So most people who believe evolution negates the need for a creator are not scientists. And therefore, their beliefs about science can and should be challenged with simple questions about scientific theories. Um, we should make people think about what they truly believe and give them the opportunity to consider other perspectives. Um, and like I said, and this is, this is the part that I think you as somebody who might be concerned about going out and sharing your faith with other people, you should not be concerned about asking challenging questions to people. We always get and ask for permission when we go out and share our faith with others. And that gives us the ability to ask questions of people. And if people, uh, and I find that the vast majority of the people that I talk to are happy to have a conversation about things. They want to be challenged and they want to challenge us. And I don't think there should be any fear on either, part, either side to ask challenging questions toward each other. You don't have to be an expert in science to ask what people believe about science to ask them and let, get them to think about it. And all we're asking for people is, is to study the information for themselves and make informed decisions. Because this is about their, their life after death and trying to understand is there really a creator out there who created me and loves me and wants what's best for me and actually shows me a path for understanding him better. And that's what we should be our goal when we go and speak with other people, is to help them to look for the truth themselves. If we look on the next slide, this is our last slide, and I just want to get you all to look at this really closely, um, just because maybe next week's presentation will be more based on some answers. So any of you all look on the beginning of this thing, go back and look at my, you can either text me at the, my cell phone number, or you can send me a quick email message, and just see if, if there's any of these you want to know more about, because I think all of them are questions that aren't adequately answered by the current scientific information. And there are abilities for people to open up a dialogue to ask people about what they really know about creation. And so I just go through them really quickly. Uh, one is, it, this is, these are good questions you can ask people to see what their scientific understanding is. If Darwinian evolution requires slow, gradual change, which that's what Darwin said, it was slow, gradual tame, it takes billions of years for this to occur, then how do we explain the Cambrian age, the explosion of almost all the known species of today occurring within a very short period of time. And why have so few changes in our uh, in life sciences occurred since then? Why are there no new species popping up all the time based on that, based on that understanding? So why did the Cambrian mage come out of nowhere and create a lot of the known species? And why haven't there been any changes per se that we can uh, address as, as similar in, in this last bit of generation since then? Another one is very interesting is understanding how blood flows in our veins. 
Have you ever thought about this? I, I think the study of hemophilia gives us a good example of what happens when genes don't occur in the right way uh, for, for blood clotting. But do you ever think about what happens if your body coagulates, if all the blood coagulated in it all at once instead of you know, just clotting around a wound? What would happen to us? Yeah, I mean, this is one of the things where the actual ability of blood to flow through your body, carry nutrients and oxygen and carbon dioxide back and forth through your body is a fascinating system that's regulated by a very few amount of genes. And those genes are very, are very specific to a specific functionality. And how did they, did they evolve separately over time? If so, then how does that also support Darwin's theory that each gene had to have a functioning purpose if it needed so many other genes to actually do the purpose it was meant to function as? So that's one of the things that I have a question. If you want to learn more about that, I think there's a great amount of information we could talk about that. Also, how was DNA first created outside of a biological organism? You look at Watson and Crick were the first ones to propose how DNA is a, a double helix spiral. They did a lot of work and a lot of labs were working on trying to understand what DNA looked like. And when they finally uncovered it and they tried to understand how DNA was formed, they were baffled because when they did the calculations to try to see how it could have randomly mutated over time to form in such a way outside of a biological system, they were puzzled as to what could actually create. I mean, almost to the point where there were suggestions they had that aliens dropped it off. I mean, that was really how baffled they were as to how this could have evolved an intricately system of information packed so tightly together that it breeds all life in the universe, in our, in our, in our planet Earth especially as we know it. So I think there's a lot to be talked about just what DNA does. And how do you explain the complexity of the eye? How it works with the optical nerve and how it works with the brain and how those images function back and forth. And how do people, how did organisms evolve without an eye especially with predator and prey scenarios if, of all those things, how did they evolve? I mean, those are questions we have to ask ourselves in the amount of time that we think that the world was created in, how did all that stuff evolve and occur? So I think the eye is a very critical thing. And if humans evolved from primates, why are there not examples of missing link species in the fossil record to show this transformation? And if primates are lower forms of life and less than humans, then why do they still exist? And why do we have such trouble finding these common ancestors if evolution answers it all? I mean, those are things we have to understand. How is the evidence of blood vessels found in recent dinosaur bones that were supposedly fossilized millions of years ago? How do, they, how do we rec reconcile that when we find dinosaur bones that have evidence of blood vessels in them? Aren't they supposed to be rock at this point after this millions and millions of years? I, I mean, those are questions that need to be answered and this things that you do not see in the, in the standard textbooks. Also, in addition to building proteins from amino acids, our biological systems also, I mean, we're talking about plants and animals, produce various different other things like vitamins and lipids to form around cells to make these cells whole. Uh, heme and chlorophyll, you know, uh, many other organic molecules are produced inside of living systems. Which came first? If all these things are essential for life, which evolved first over the other and why? How do we, how do we know that that's what happened? I'm, I'm just saying these are questions that I'd be really curious to see what people have answers for. How to defense, this is my favorite one. If you ever read the book, and a lot of these things, these ideas, I'll give credit to Matt Soniak from Mental Floss. He had some of these ideas of some of these. Um, two books, Michael Behe's Darwin's Black Box and, um, and The Heretic, One Scientist's Journey from Darwin to Design, Matt Leasola and Jonathan Witt. There are some excellent resources for looking up, and I, I give some of these examples. Some of these are from those, those sources of ideas, of questions. These are things that you want to ask people. And I thought one of the best questions in there, how does the defense mechanism of the bombardier beetle develop? The bombardier beetle basically scalds to death its people with a hot liquid that it shoots out. How did that evolve? Why did it evolve? How come more species don't have that in their systems? I mean, there's just questions like that. I'm curious, is all the, the complexity of life that is out there, the how we don't know how some of these things uh, form and how, understand how some of these things uh, connect with other species. How is memory created? How would this have evolved? And it's not just humans that have memories. We know that animals have memories too. 
as we can train animals to go through obstacle courses and understand things. Memory is something that's a very interesting thing that there's still a lot of questions about answering on this. And, also, and the last thing is, how did our planet actually exist? How did we have this equal distance from the sun that created an environment where water vapor could turn to water and not freeze or turn to a gas and leave our atmosphere? How do we have an environment where we're that close to the sun but not far enough away? That we have water, that we have an ozone layer, that we have tectonic plates that move our, our planet around in a way that things just don't uh, continually uh, have volcanoes exploding all the time and mass terror occurring from uh, all the issues that would be associated with uh, uh, all the stresses that occur on a planet as it's moving through space and revolving around the sun. I mean, what is gravity? How is gravity formed? What is gravity made up of? Answers that we just don't have, we don't have answers for. But I think those are things that we could dive into more in another session where we take one or two of those topics and really help you feel comfortable sharing your thoughts on that with other people and getting answers and help, trying to help them understand that all the answers have not been done by science. Science has not answered all the questions about life. And it's very important that we as uh, Christians help people understand that and help people share the, and help share the gospel with people because that's what Jesus taught us to do in the Great Commission was he told us that we were supposed to share our faith with others because sharing our faith is the way that we show love for the Father. We share our faith because we want other people to go to heaven. We want other people to understand things and to feel the saving power of Jesus just like we have because we don't want anybody to perish any more than, than God wants anybody to perish because he loves us all. Anyway, that's where I'm going to stop right now. Uh, next week, like I said, hit me up on either email or my phone number. Uh, you can text me or email me and just let me know if there are any of those topics you'd like to know a little bit more detail about, and I will give you a, a good insight into how you could share those with other people. So I thank you very much for your time and attention tonight. Look forward to talking to you the next five, five more weeks here, and I look forward to when we can go out and go visit with people in our community. So take care, and thanks, and have a good evening.